virtual worship service this morning. It was great to see so many of you last week for our drive in worship outside. But wherever you are today, we're so glad that you're joining us. We want to say a special welcome if this is your first time worshiping with us uh, online, no matter where you might be. Uh, welcome to Downing Avenue Christian Church. Uh, if you want to learn more about our church family, you can connect to the website or reach out to any of our uh, staff or volunteers who are listed on the website. We'd be glad to talk to you more about getting involved in our Downing family uh, during this virtual era. There are a couple of special opportunities uh, that we want to invite everyone to, including this coming Saturday. It's going to be a really important training day that's for members and friends of Downey Avenue Christian Church specifically. We're going to be working with the Disciples of Christ Reconciliation Ministries to provide an anti-racism training. How do we as a congregation work together to make sure that our practices, our language, uh, our ethos, our missions, our programs are all inclusive and reflective of all of God's children? We hope you can join us this Saturday. There are details that went out in the newsletter this morning. Uh, so you can register for that, and we'll see you Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. As always, you can connect with us on Tuesdays after, afternoons as well for our weekly prayer call. Uh, and we have that every week as a devotional time, a, a time to share our feelings and concerns with one another. Uh, we're also looking at, as uh, COVID continues to go on, we'd like to pr provide uh, more people's opportunity to connect with that phone call. Um, so if you are interested in Tuesdays at 2, just as it worked for you, uh, please let us know that. There's a, a survey that went out in the email this morning, and if there's another day that a time that works for you and you want to join us, uh, please let us know through that survey. And in a couple of weeks, not this Saturday, but next Saturday will be the Indiana Disciples Regional Assembly that happens every other year. This year will be all virtual, of course, with there's some great speakers, worship uh, lined up, so uh, check out the, the email for that as well. And right after worship today, you don't have to wait till another day to connect, because after worship today, we're going to have our first ever virtual fellowship time. When we're here in the sanctuary, normally uh, we're able to go right after worship to the parlor and see one another to share a cup of coffee. Uh, and this morning, we're going to get to do that virtually, right from your couch or wherever you are. Um, so stay tuned for uh, the Zoom link that will go out in the chat, as well as in the newsletter this morning. Uh, stick around, say hi to all your downy friends that we've missed seeing face-to-face uh, -face during this time. Let us connect now with God and with one another as we worship. As always, we encourage you to gather that list of items on your screen so you feel more at home during our time together and be part of the interactive element of our worship service. So gather those items if you haven't already, and let us worship God together. <laughs>
Good morning, friends. Today we are trying something new. We're going to do our children's moment via Zoom. So you should see our Zoom screen pop up for, uh, hopefully, for our families with children at home to be uh, able to join us here and contribute to our children's moment. So we are going to have Bailey Flowers join us and uh, hopefully uh, Brooklyn and Elena Steele and their families are going to contribute and Anna Nowak is going to contribute as well and participate in our Zoom conversation. So you can feel like the children are right here in worship with us. And that way we can hear their voices and see their adorable faces. So good morning, Elena and Marilyn and Bailey and Anna. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you guys can join us via Zoom today. Now, I want to talk to you about a sad subject. Let me ask you, have you ever cried before? Raise your hand if you've ever cried before, ever in your whole life. Elena, you've never cried before? I find that very hard to believe, particularly because I've seen you cry before. Well, I have here in my hand a bottle of tears. Okay, it's not really tears. But there is a verse in the Bible in Psalm where David, the writer of that Psalm, writes, to God and says, God, I cry so many tears, you could fill up a whole bottle with my tears. Now let me ask you, let me ask you of something that has made you cry. Is there something that has made you cry? Like, have you ever, raise your hand if you've fallen down and gotten hurt and cried. I have. Raise your hand if you've cried because Someone did something unkind and it hurt your feelings. Raise your hand if that made you cry. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever cried just because someone else was crying. And when someone else is crying, it makes you feel like crying too. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Yeah. Is there something else that you'd like to share that has made you cry? What else has made you cry? Something you'd like to tell us about? You can unmute yourself and tell us if you'd like. Nobody wants to unmute themselves and say anything that's made them cry? Um, Elena, what's sister, made you cry? When my sister cried by, by something, um, I always um, cry at her so it makes her feel better. And then you like, laugh when I do that. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Elena. So when your sister cry, cries, cry, sometimes cry. you no, cry no. with her and it makes her feel better. I'm so glad you said that because that's exactly what I want to talk about. Did you know that in the Bible there's a verse that says that Jesus weeps? Jesus cried. He cried so many times in the Bible. He cried when, when people didn't understand what he was saying and he knew he could help them and they just couldn't get it. He cried when, when people were making choices that were going to hurt them. And then he cried when one of his friends died. And he was so upset about it that he, he wept and he cried and cried. And that's important for us to know because Jesus cries along with us. God cries along with us. God weeps when we weep and is sad when we're sad. So don't ever feel alone when you're crying and don't ever feel like you shouldn't cry because sometimes it's really important to cry and let it out. So remember, whenever you cry, God cries with you and feels the sadness you feel too. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for loving us so much that when we feel sad, you feel sad. When we cry, you cry. And as always, dear God, thank you for the children. Amen. Bye, everyone.
Sorry, we're having some audio issues this morning, but hopefully you can hear me okay from home. Uh, and uh, even if you couldn't hear everything just fine, it was really nice uh, to be
to be able to watch Bailey eat breakfast in our den uh, during the children's moment. So thank you, uh, Melody, and our great team uh, for making that happen. Uh, will you say a word of prayer with me? Holy God, on this beautiful day that you have made, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, if you're one of those know-it-all church people who have spent a lot of time in Sunday school over the years, you're probably familiar with those three omni words that church people throw around. Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. These are the three characteristics of God that the church has leaned on for centuries. That God is omniscient, that God is all-knowing, that is to say, that God's omnipotent, which is all-powerful, and that God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that even though I've been to seminary, that I could provide a, a really clear articulation of all three of those words as far as how we defend them in our faith. I think that for centuries, Christians have heard those words, and, and even if you've never heard the word, heard the idea behind the word. That God knows everything, that God is everywhere, that God can do everything, anything. Those ideas are so pervasive in our faith that we almost swallow them every day as if they were vibrants. Not sure if they're really changing all that much, not sure if they're really working, but we've done it for so long, we might as well keep taking them. But the thing is, those words don't always bring comfort when they need to. Explaining to someone that God is omnipotent when they've lost a loved one hardly brings any comfort. My favorite preacher that I quote all the time, William Sloan Coffin, he was the pastor of Riverside Church in New York City for many years. And a few years into his tenure at that church came one of his greatest challenges. It wasn't from a board that was overreaching or from churches that were fighting or anything like that. But rather, seven years after he became the senior minister, William Sloan Coffin suffered a tragedy. His son, Alex, late one night, was driving, and his car drove and veered off the bridge and crashed in the river below. He died, and the very next Sunday, Reverend Coffin returned to church. In the midst of that grief, in the midst of that sorrow and that loss. And he said that he had to come back to church because all the trite little things that people were saying outside of church just weren't working. That he got all sorts of Hallmark cards trying to tie a neat little bow with a rainbow on the loss of his son. Well, many Christians would call him to check and see how he was doing, and not knowing what to say or how to say it, how to get off the phone call when it was time. They would say things like, it was just his time, I guess. It was just God's will. Or maybe they'd say something like, you know, God's plan is just such a mystery on this side of life. And those things never brought any comfort to the family. He tells the story in particular of one sweet lady from the church who brought by a casserole 
a few days after Alex had died. And she comes in and, and sets it on top of the big pile of food, and they make room so that the mountain doesn't fall over. And they bring the food in, and the lady sets it down, and she just doesn't really know what to say, so she's kind of quiet and kind of awkward and kind of sheepish and doesn't say much. But she knows she has to say something. And so on the way out the door, she says, I'm so sorry for your loss. I just don't understand God's will. The pastor couldn't take it anymore. And this person who was over six feet tall, who had served in the CIA before becoming a minister, chases this sweet old lady out the door and says, you better believe you don't understand God's will, lady. Don't tell me that this was God's will. God's heart was the first to break. God didn't want my son to die, he said. God wanted him to live, and the tragedy prevented the will of God. Clearly, it struck a nerve with the preacher. Though I agree with him, I also admittedly feel kind of sorry for that sweet old lady who had brought the food by. But in my own losses, I, too, can admit that the trite little expressions just don't work all the time. We better believe we don't understand God's will. As great as it is to, to try to put God in some small little theological box, to have a nice tidy little bow tied around it, with one of those three omni words. As nice as that sounds, in theory, as nice as it seems in well meaning classes, the truth is that in tragedy, the fact that God knew what was going to happen. That God could have done something about it. That God had the power to change it. And that God sat by and watched it happen. Those three omni words don't add up. It's honestly why I think so many people, when tragedy strikes, if that's all we have to stand on, this image that God is the puppet master of the universe, if that's all we have to lean back on in tragedy, then too many people lean away from faith, a faith that doesn't work in those difficult times. God is not the puppet master of the universe. We don't pray to God to try to change God's mind to try to bend God and to contorting into whatever will we want. God is not the puppet master of the universe. Now I'll say, I have no authority to say that that is an invalid perspective. If it works for you in times of tragedy, I'm not here to take it away. I don't think it's invalid, I just think it's insufficient. I think it's insufficient of the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels. The person that we profess to be Lord and Savior was made known to us through the act of entering into this world. Not standing out above it or beyond it, but by coming right into it. By trying on pain and suffering to see and know and feel what it is like to be a human being trying to make it through a day or a week or a lifetime. Jesus did not roam the earth as some kind of robot just trying to go around and fixing everything that was broken. 
when we read the Bible, we see quite clearly that what Jesus experienced came really close to what we experienced. Jesus knew what it was to suffer. Jesus knew what it was to be hungry. You remember that story about him in the desert? Jesus knew what it was to be thirsty. You remember that story of him on the cross? I thirst. Jesus knew what it was to be exhausted, to be overwhelmed, to be tired of watching everyone around you get sick. Jesus knew what it was to have friends. Jesus knew what it was to have friends betray him. Jesus knew what it was to be angry. And Jesus knew what it was to grieve. The range of experiences and emotions that make you and I human beings is precisely what Jesus experienced on this earth. We even see it in the scripture that Toma read for us. Story, not about Jesus being raised from the dead, but about Jesus raising another person from the dead. The story of a person named Lazarus. And Lazarus dies. And the story, the, the story shows us that the family was stricken with grief. Jesus shows up to the house of two sisters, Mary and Martha who are overcome with grief. Jesus shows up to a house that's distraught. And in the midst of their tears, if you were reading the scripture carefully, you almost could just kind of feel their anger. Jesus, if you had been here, if you had been here, our brother would still be alive. It's a statement of faith, but it's a statement of anger and exasperation and despair. It's an anger that so many of us feel when we need to look for someone to blame. Who among us, in our darkest hours, in whatever tragedy, Whatever suffering we face, like the two strong, courageous women in this story, who among us, if we're honest with ourselves, doesn't get angry? Where were you, God? Why did you let that happen? It's not the end of the story. Jesus doesn't leave them in their suffering. Jesus doesn't abandon them in their grief or their sorrow. Lazarus is raised from the dead. And it shows us not just that Jesus could do great miracles. Though certainly, what a great miracle. What a power I wish I had. It's not just a story of the great things Jesus can do, though. It's also a story that shows us that in the midst of grief, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of despair, that Jesus shows up. Jesus came into their home. Jesus sat with them in their grief and their suffering. You. And as famous as the ending of the story might be, because it's not that often that people get raised from the dead, as much as we want to celebrate what an incredible thing that happens in this story, there's another part of the story that actually might be even a little bit more famous than the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I remember being in children's Sunday school and just hoping and hoping and hoping 
that the memory verse of the week one day would finally be the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words long. You know what it is? Jesus wept. At least that's how it goes in the King James Version. Two words. None of these long sentences and paragraphs to have to memorize. Jesus wept. That's the whole verse. There's a period at the end of the sentence. That's what you need to know. But as short as it is, the brevity of that statement ought not to rob it of its power. Jesus does not just observe the pain that Mary and Martha feel. Jesus participates in it. Jesus understands it. Jesus knows it. Jesus lives it alongside them. Jesus' heart is there breaking wide open in their suffering. I suppose Jesus could have just lectured Mary and Martha. Why are you so sad? Don't you know I've got all these awesome powers? Don't you know it'll be okay in the end? Don't you know God's omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient and all those things? Why are you crying? But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus wept. Jesus felt their pain as if it was his own. Because for most of us, when we grieve, Jesus does not miraculously change the situation. Jesus doesn't reverse the course of events and make the pain go away. But here we see that even if God cannot fix all of the problems of life, even if God cannot prevent us from going through this life and suffering, God walks with us through this life. God walks alongside us in our despair. Jesus wept. And Jesus weeps again. Each time we suffer. Jesus weeps. Each time we experience pain and loss and grief. Jesus weeps when we're overwhelmed. When we're not sure if we can pace another week. And in the midst of that weeping, Jesus shows up. True enough, not going to go home this afternoon and Jesus knock on your door and walk on in. But Jesus shows up in the most unexpected ways. Jesus shows up through you. Jesus shows up through the people around you. When we talk about being made in the image of God, that means we reflect who God is. When we summon the best of ourselves, when we show that love that Jesus shared, we are sharing no less than God's own presence. Yes, Jesus healed. Yes, Jesus did great miracles. But Jesus also wept. And in that way, I suppose Jesus is the original wounded healer. Borrow a great phrase from Henry Now. In our own weeping, no matter what it is that we need healing from, may we never forget the power, the grace of sharing our pain sharing our pain through one another to the very one who was himself a wounded healer. Because for all the emotions and all the experiences that Jesus had, beyond all the things that Jesus felt, beyond hunger and thirst, beyond friendship and anger, 
beyond joy and suffering, even more than those things, Jesus showed us that he knew what it was to love. And Jesus shows us that that love lives on through you. That love, which shines brightest in our darkest hours, that love which is the balm in Gilead, that love which reminds us that we may be small, but we are never too small for God's grace. And so if you want to be a theologian, and you want to throw around all those big omni words or concoct some Latin phrase to explain who God is, that's all well and good. But more than all those words that seem to fall away in suffering, there's one that I think we can stand by. That God is above all else. Omni-loving. God is all loving. There is no fiber of God's being that is judgment or hate or rejection. God is love. That might come from the scripture that we read last week. I can't say it enough. What else is there to know about God in the midst of all the uncertainties but that God is love? We are all wounded in our own way. But we are not alone. And in times, in due time, our wounds turn to scars and become the very vessels of love and compassion that remind us of where we've come from. Those wounds become the scars that help us to share our lives with one another, that help us to be more present with another in their suffering. And so Jesus shows us not just what it is to heal, but what it is to be a wounded healing. So may healing begin. Let healing begin right now from this place, from this time and this moment. Let the healing begin through you. For you, too, are made in the image of God. The God who is all love. And the God who loves us all.
And if you look at your calendar, you will see that Tuesday is the autumnal equinox, the official start of fall. In some ways, fall is a time of balance, when the sun is directly above the equator, <coughs> causing the daytime hours to equal the nighttime hours. It is in between time, between the heat of summer and the cold of winter, between a season of growth and a season of dormancy, between a time of outdoor play and a time of mostly indoor activities. Of course, each of these notions of balance or in-betweenness can also be interpreted as a time of change. How does this have to do with our mission at Downey? Well, first, we must know that things can, should, and will change. As you have heard in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to everything there is a season. As we enter a new church year, there will be some changes in leadership, also known as opportunities for new involvement. A new board of elders is having their first meeting today after worship. The deacons will do the same shortly. And some leadership positions within the mission teams will be passed along. You will see new faces and hear new voices in worship, and perhaps in the care and contact from your elders. For some, this will be a time of rest, reflection, and rejuvenation. For others, a new experience of participation and involvement in the life of the church. Maybe you will find inspiration to join a ministry team to work with others in a specific effort for a specific cause. And then, just as we have seen the signs of fall in a variety of ways, we must stop, look, and listen for our own calling as individuals as a and as a congregation. We recognize our calling for the opportunities the needs and the crises within our community and the world around us intersect with our strengths, skills, and the interests and passions. Open your eyes, your ears, and your heart, and your personal calling will become clear to you. If your calling and inspiration today includes participating in the financial support of the congregation and its mission, you are invited now to make that gift via the church's website, either as a one-time special offering, or as an ongoing pledge, or by sending a check through the mail to the church office. You may choose to support the general budget of the church or to indicate a special ministry, perhaps the performing arts and the music for a special performance, maybe the food pantry for necessary purchases, or possibly the current renovations and creation of the Mission Outreach Center. In all cases, know that your gifts will be used along with all others in support of the mission and ministry of Downing.
We come now to our time of prayer, where we share our joys and concerns with one another and our community. There are a few prayer requests that I'd like to mention this morning. We continue to lift up Cheryl Binkley, who's recovering at home after a brain surgery on September 9th. Uh, Cheryl's been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and so our, our hearts go out to her and our prayers are extended for her. We want to continue to pray for Diana Altum. Uh, her s- surgery has been scheduled for September 28th. Originally, we reported September 18th, but it's September 28th, so coming up uh, early next week. So we pray for Diana and her surgery, that all will go well, and that this will remedy her situation. Toma Bastin asks for prayers of condolences to her neighbors, the Short Ridges, who lost their son, Dalton, to suicide on Thursday. So we pray uh, for that family and their incredible loss. Will you join me as we go to God in prayer together? Holy God, on this day, it feels important to be reminded that you weep with us, that you share in our anger sometimes, that you understand the feelings that we have, that Jesus, our Savior, wept. I know that These are trying times, God. God, I know that for so many of us, we feel like just pulling the covers over our head and staying in bed. God, remind us that wherever we are, in whatever space we find ourselves, that you reside there with us. That your spirit comforts us weeps with us, rejoices with us. God, I pray for each person that is feeling pain and loss and heartache today. I pray, God, that each person will feel the comfort of your spirit, will feel the renewing of your spirit, will feel your spirit giving new life to continue on better even than before. Thank you, God, for the ways that you revive us, heal us, and move us forward, even when it feels impossible to step forward. Hear us now, God, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
This morning, brothers and sisters, as we gather bread and cup and gather around the table, we are reminded that we come sometimes in grief, sometimes in fear, sometimes in joy. This morning, I come to this table with joy in reminder of my favorite communion hymn, I Come With Joy. And in that hymn, I heard a line that says that I come with joy, forgiven, loved, and freed. And in that forgiveness, love, and freed, we can come together as one people, one family, in united in Christ, forgiven, loved, and freed, and able to invite others to the table. And I'm so glad to be able this morning to do that very thing, to stand here to invite you to this table as I have been invited. Forgiven, loved, and freed. Let us pray. God, as we come to this table, it reminds us that you created us all in your image to be valued and loved. We ask that you give us courage to not close our eyes or hearts when we see injustice and allow us to use the voice you gave us to speak out. We pray that you help us know that every life is seen as valuable, no matter where a person was born or lives, rich or poor, male or female, the same as us or different. We pray that everyone be treated with respect and dignity, for we know the value we place on the least of these is the value we place on you. Amen. Friends, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us now eat with Jesus. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant shed for all. Let us drink. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning and hanging in there with some audio issues that thankfully are now fixed. So thanks to our great AV team that uh, is up there uh, for all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes to make this happen each and every week. Uh, hope that you can stick around for a few minutes longer as we switch over to uh, a Zoom call uh, for our virtual fellowship time. So Anna's going to post the link there in the live chat. If you haven't already found that link, you can also go to the weekly newsletter email that went out this morning and click the link from that as well. Uh, but I hope you can join us uh, for the Zoom call uh, just to say hello to one another, to see all these Downey friends that we've missed uh, seeing face-to-face -face, uh, for our virtual coffee hour. But before that, let us go out now with this benediction. May you go forth and live freely and fully, leaving all your worries, your fears, your troubles behind, and take in their place faith and hope and love. For these are the great gifts from Christ to each of you. Amen. Go in peace.